episode 148 of Late Night Linux, recorded on the 25th of October 2021. I'm Joe, and with me are Phelan. Guten Abend. Graham. Bonsoir. And Will. Hello! <laughs> oh, you should have done Spanish or something. Or oh, someone should have said hello in a spooky voice because it's nearly Halloween. Anyway, before we get started, I've had an idea Linux jobs. Now, all the time I see people on Twitter or wherever looking for people to join their team. There seems to be something of a labor shortage. I know that a lot of our listeners may be looking for a new job or looking to change job. So instead of paying recruiters a bunch of money, why not pay us to advertise the role? We'll try and keep it short, I think. Just a brief description of the role, what you're looking for, whether it's remote or not. And I would suggest that remote makes the most sense for this. And we'll do one once in a while, maybe one an episode. We'll see how much interest we get in this. So get in touch, show at latenightlinux.com if you're interested in getting the word out about your vacancies to thousands of Linux people, and we'll see where it goes. But let's get into the news then. The first one is good news, surely. Apple joins the Blender Development Fund as a patron member, which, if I'm not mistaken, means €120,000 or more per year. I think this is good news, um lots of money to um, an open source company organization and, and Blender is a really great project. I also think it's quite interesting from Apple because until recently they didn't really have any kind of OpenGL or GPU capabilities but uh, the new M1 processors seem to have lots of GPU capabilities and while that may not be so interesting from an Apple proprietary sense, I personally hope it means they've got a VR headset in development and this is their <laughs> resurgence of um, more 3D acceleration. Yeah, or it could be their AR stuff, possibly. Yeah, there's a big convergence there that might mean in better VR. Phelan, you're not quite as optimistic about this. I'm not optimistic. I'm trying not to be <laughs> pessimistic. I'm just hoping that they're expecting to not get anything special. I mean... Yeah, obviously they have funded the development of the project like everybody else. If you put in some money, you're sure to be able to call some shots. But I hope it's not an attempt to try and, um, let me see, steer it too far in a direction only for their advantage. I think the project is big enough and mature enough and has enough other financial income that they could resist being bent to uh, Apple's desires. I think it's it's great for Apple users um, because if you're uh, a, a graphic, uh, whatever they call them, what do they call them, designers or modelers, or you know, if you're building things in uh, on a Mac in Blender, then that's good for the Blender project. And if you can do it on your M1 Mac, then uh, you'll be able to do it on the plane and all sorts. I think this is good for good for the whole project. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think you hopefully are correct with that. I mean, I hope this is more of, you know, benefiting the community and the, and the project rather than the sort of way FreeBSD benefited exactly not so much at all from the use of the kernel. I'm not so sure that's true, you know. What? That they didn't benefit? Yeah. Ugh, they did not benefit. They might got a bit crumbs off the table but yeah i mean like look at how freebsc is taken over the world oh yeah he hasn't his arse i don't think it's from lack of apple giving back though to the bsd project i think they're probably where they want to be it always seems that way to me they're quite austere in their ambition but i mean i do think this is worth i mean I think the blender project in particular is a, a really good news story um I, rem- I mean one of the first places i worked was a 3d graphics company um, and it was prohibitively expensive to get involved in 3D anything. We paid for Lightwave on Amigas and PCs. It was, I can't remember, it was hundreds and hundreds of euros, probably even more than that. I still got the Amiga dongle. And even things like fluid mechanics, if you needed it, or smoke or light, all of those things were paid add-ons. And it's still amazing to me that something like Blender exists. And even with its UI quirks, which have improved recently, it's still amazing that you can get that kind of stuff for free. Yeah, and the people behind it seem pretty cool. Campbell Barton, for example, he's a really cool guy. So it's like this poster child, isn't it, for open source? It's one of the big flagship open source products out there. Yeah, maybe if Campbell's listening, he could let us know if he thinks it'll be okay, what his opinion is. Or maybe his friend who also sounds similar but isn't definitely (laughs) him could write in in case he's worried about his B45. Yeah, I I don't think that it's going to be a problem. There's enough money going into that project that if Apple pisses them off, they can just tell them to get fucked. So it'll be fine. It'll make 3D stuff better on Apple products. 
And I, I can't see that being a negative in any way. Something you found, Will, Loftcrack, I think that's how you say it, is now open source. This is old school Windows uh, cracker software. Yeah, this is from back in the uh, mid to late 90s when Windows NT was a thing. Um, Loftcrack was the go-to password cracking tool if you were into that sort of thing. Uh, it, it builds itself as a password auditing tool because, of course, it does. But uh, the big news at the time was you know, that there was this uh, Windows NT had come out and there was this flaw in the encryption algorithms they'd used for the passwords and this was the tool that could could go and recover them uh, i think it was um a lot of brute force and um some advanced rainbow tables and and things like that but this was a, a sort of a well-renowned tool it's gone around a little bit it's it's transferred from from various owners over the years it was owned by semantic for a little while and then bought back by the original authors um, and then it went to somebody else and then it came back again and now it's being released as open source. So I think you know, if you've been around for a long time, this will be quite interesting to you and it'll be interesting to go and look at the, the code and see how it worked. But it's not quite uh, as, as open as, um, as I first thought it was. If you look at the license file, there's about three or four different licenses in there. There's the MIT license, the Apache license, the John the Ripper license, and even some, uh, some other sort of library licenses, open SSL licenses and so on. But uh, nevertheless, the source is there. It is open. And uh, yeah, it's a nice little bit of history that's now open source. What bard is on your modem? 1,200 down, 75 up. Boom. Just a quick mention for this, because this is fucking hilarious. Moxie Marlin Spike has made an NFT that just makes a mockery of the whole NFT thing, and it's fucking brilliant. Depending on who's looking at it, it changes, and whoever buys it will ultimately end up with a shit emoji, a turd emoji, whatever you call it, poop emoji, as the Americans say. It's fucking genius. It makes about as much sense as an NFT does, so yeah. And as we record, there's only 32 minutes left, and it's over a $1,000 bid. I don't know, it's as if people think, oh yeah, this is so ridiculous that I've got to own it. But the point he's making is that at least with some NFTs, if not all, it's literally just a link to a VPS somewhere, and you can just change that whatever you want. In this case, probably with quite a clever script or whatever, but that person who is paying for the VPS could stop paying for that and then your link is dead and then you paid money for fuck all. It is almost worth buying because it's genius in its art form of showing how bullshit this whole thing is. So well done, Moxie. On to a bit of admin then. And first of all, thank you everyone who supports us with PayPal and Patreon. We really do appreciate that. You can go to latenightlinux.com slash support for details. And remember that for $5 or more per month on Patreon, you can get an advert-free RSS feed. And that includes Late Night Linux, Late Night Linux Extra, and Linux After Dark. So it's a bargain. And do check out the latest Late Night Linux Extra, number 33. I had Neil Gomper and Jim Salter from Two and a Half Admins on to talk about ButterFS, essentially. And Neil is very pro ButterFS, and Jim is pretty down on it favoring ZFS and they've clashed a bit publicly but I got them together to talk about it to be honest it was mostly just them two having a chat about it and me uh, just sitting there listening but it is well worth it so do check that out link in the show notes and obviously Linux After Dark as well there'll be a new episode of that on Friday so uh, get subscribed to the all episodes feed if you just search for late night Linux all episodes that's what you want that gets you everything or obviously become a patron and get it all without ads Okay, this episode is sponsored by Linode. Go to linode.com slash late night Linux and see why Linode has been voted the top infrastructure as a service provider by both G2 and TrustRadius. From their award-winning support offered 24-7, 365 to every level of user, to ease of use and setup, it's clear why developers have been trusting Linode for projects both big and small since 2003. Deploy your entire application stack with Linode's one-click app marketplace or build it all from scratch and manage everything yourself with supported centralized tools like Terraform. Linode offers great price-to-performance value for all compute instances, including GPUs, as well as block storage, Kubernetes, and their upcoming bare metal release. Linode makes cloud computing fast, simple, and affordable, allowing you to focus on your projects, not your infrastructure. 
So go to linode.com slash late night Linux, create a free account with your Google or GitHub account or your email address, and you'll get $100 in credit. That's linode.com slash late night Linux. Let's talk about the exciting world of licenses and GPL enforcement, or in this case, a GPL enforcement. Normally, we wouldn't get too excited about this, but fuck Trump, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so he wants to start this uh, social media thing. He's, he's had a couple of goes at it, including his failed blog thing. But this time he seems to be serious about it. And it went prematurely live, seemingly as a fuck up, maybe as a test, I don't know. And it is quite clearly based on Mastodon. And so the fucking knives came out. Right, where's the source code? This is AGPL software. You've got 30 days. Give us the source code. And then just nothing back from them. And so Bradley Kuhn of the Software Freedom Conservancy has written a post about this and sets out that an AGPL violation has very likely taken place here and it needs to be sorted out quickly. And as far as I'm concerned, if Conservancy wants to take this all the way to court and everything... Do a crowdfunder. I'm fucking in. All right. For the for the non-licensed aficionado audience members, what is the difference between the AGPL and the normal GPL? The AGPL was designed for software that runs on a remote computer that you interact with. So Mastodon is like Twitter, obviously, as we've talked about. That's running on their server, and you are interacting with it. Because it's AGPL, it means that any interaction with it, just loading a web page, I think, is even enough. And certainly signing up for it and using the service means that every user is entitled to a copy of the source code of the, the whole application. And it looks like, in this case, they've forked Mastodon. We don't know 100% yet, but it certainly looks that way. And if that is the case, then they have to give us all their changes as well that they've made to it, or at least anyone who uses the software. I've not used it, so I'm not entitled to it, but a bunch of people did, including the people who managed to sign up as Donald Trump. (laughs) (laughs) I would be very surprised if they've made any changes, really. (laughs) I can't see them willing to invest in anything rather than just fork it and use it or just, you know, download it and run it. Uh, I, I would bet that that's what's going on here, but I'd like to see them in court anyway. I was just thinking when you said that, they've probably done a said and replaced all the author's names with <laughs> Donald Trump. <Yeah. laughs> I realise that I've just alienated all the remaining Trump supporters in our audience, and that's a really bad business move. But I think like, if you'd made it this far and hadn't worked out that we all hate him, then maybe that's on you. Oh, we're going to get some post next week. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think we were going to mention this, but it's also been a busy few weeks for the um, Software Freedom Conservancy over another issue where I thought was interesting. They filed a case against the TV manufacturer, Vizio Inc., for their TV, smart TV software. But for the first time, they've done this from the consumer perspective rather than from the perspective of somebody who owns the software copyright rights, which I think is really in- interesting. So if there's a GPL violation as a customer, as somebody who uses the television, you obviously have a right to the software. And that would be really interesting as well to see how that goes. Yeah, no, I'm not generally a fan of getting litigious quickly. And I remember when this blew up on the uh, Linux kernel mailing list, that must have been five or six years ago, about whether you have to be seen to be enforcing the GPL and copyleft generally. Otherwise, it's just fucking pointless. And there was a big brouhaha about it. And I came down on the side of, it's got to be a last resort, hasn't it? But that last resort has got to be there. And it is folks like the uh, Conservancy who are willing to do that work and have the resources to do it and the know-how. Yeah, because otherwise it has no teeth. I agree, and it should be a last resort, and I hate it getting litigious as well. But I guess that, yeah, there are limits. People need to know that if they're using software developed by other people released under a certain license and they have a certain obligation, that's the advantage. So the PinePhone Pro has been announced. This is a new version of the PinePhone based on a similar SoC to the PineBook Pro, but slightly modified to use less power and be more suitable for a phone. It's got a little bit more RAM, but it's more expensive. It's $400, and that's without shipping and taxes and everything. I would expect to have to pay about £400 to get this into the UK, which feels a little bit too much for what you're going to get. Yeah, I really welcome a hardware bump, but... 
it's I still need the software to work. First and foremost, you know, we talked about it. And before I even start web browsing or wanting to look at something on YouTube, I really just need to be able to get some messages and make a phone call. Yeah, that was my first thought was, well, hang on, you haven't finished the first one yet and you put in the second one out. What's going on here? And it's funny, if you look at how many operating systems there are, how many distros, whatever you want to call it, images for the original Pine phone now, that list has grown massively. Doesn't mean any of them are finished, but there's plenty of images for it. And that's good, I guess, but it's not anywhere near close to being a daily driver and does throwing in a little bit more hardware at it and more horsepower at it, does that really make the difference? I have a feeling that it might do because rather than forcing developers to optimize early with the software where they might end up spending ages on that, if you can give them just a bit more to get over some of the humps, maybe it makes enough of a difference that it can take a bit of pressure off trying to optimize rather than to work on features that they might need, like, as you say, the dialer and various bits like that. Yeah, but I I never had the impression they didn't work because of lack of optimization. Those things should even work on the original Pine phone. And do we know what level the firmware is at for, like, do they have to work on hardware drivers for that to work? Or is it just literally the actual dialing software? I think it's a bit of both. A few people have been in touch with me since we covered this, and they're really hopeful that the the recent, very recent patches in their kernel will work. So I think it's a bit of both, and it just needs to work, I think, for it to be to be able to move on. I think this might be my, my phone for when my OnePlus 3T dies, because the headphone jack ejects itself every time I like look at the phone sideways when I'm trying to walk. So it's getting close to the point where I'm going to have to bin it or get a new board for the bottom part. Bluetooth. (laughs) Never. (laughs) I have a Bluetooth headset, and do you know what it can do? It can fuck right off into the river because it's a piece of shite. I only wouldn't throw it in the river because I don't want to poison the world. So seriously, then, are you going to buy one of these, Phantom? Yeah, I think I will, yeah. Um, I I can't justify just a moment, but yeah, I'll let the first developer round, I think, go through and then get it after that in a second. Okay, this episode is sponsored by CBT Nuggets training for IT professionals or anyone looking to build IT skills. Go to cbtnuggets.com slash late night Linux and sign up for a seven day free trial. The on-demand virtual labs mean you can build practical experience with the commands, config, scripts and everything you need to get the most out of each course. Another standout feature is the accountability coaching service available to all learners with a subscription, which gives you access to a real person who will help you craft a personalized learning plan and set goals and will check in with you to keep you accountable. So start your free seven day trial today at cbtnuggets.com slash late night Linux. It includes unlimited access to all course materials, including virtual labs. That's cbtnuggets.com slash late night Linux. Microsoft has managed to piss off the community again, this time over VS Code and a feature called Hot Reload, which I don't fully understand, but sounds like it's pretty useful. (laughs) I'm afraid the money-making shower bastard Microsoft is quite operational after all. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, go on, fail him. Go on, gloat. I'm afraid... My doctor has prescribed me anti-gloat medication because I had a (laughs) gloat overdose during the week. (laughs) So this feature was touted as this next big thing that was going to be part of .NET. But then at the last minute, Microsoft or someone in Microsoft decided that they would only have it in Visual Studio and not in the free VS Code. But then there was a massive backlash And then they changed their mind again, back to having it in VS Code. But what this has demonstrated is that Microsoft may not love Linux and open source quite as much as they purport to. I especially love where the people were ordered not to complain. So we had all these passive-aggressive Twitter posts from various MVPs throughout the organization. Is that minimal viable product? <laughs> <laughs> I believe it is most valuable professionals, but I'm not sure. Ah, uh, sorry. Well, Phelan, you found this post by Dustin Morris called Can We Trust Microsoft with Open Source? And he makes the point that it's not just about this. It is a deeper problem that there are certain people and entities and groups and teams within Microsoft who 
are pretty hostile to open source still. But he also makes the point that there's some really great people who do care a lot about it and makes the point that I always come back to, that Microsoft is this massive fucking organization made up of people and people have different agendas and opinions and stuff. And yeah, the organization has a power structure and it's steered in various directions. But I don't think it's fair to say that Microsoft doesn't care about open source or can't be trusted. I think that there are certain people within Microsoft who can't be trusted, but then there's a whole load of people who do care and are trying to make the organization better. I think it can exactly be said that Microsoft doesn't care about it. I mean, whatever about the engineers or MVPs, whatever, it's a shareholder run company that its primary objective is to make money. And if making money is shafting open source, that's what they'll do. Yes, but conversely, if making money means embracing open source and contributing to it because you end up making more money than you invested in it, then that's also their objective. Their objective is to make money, and sometimes that happens from being good to open source. I know, but uh, the problem is that you end up flip-flopping quite easily because if you're following a ticker tape in a in a stock market, all these decisions, whether they go up or down, is just it's on a whim. It's how the market feels that day. And you know, do you really want to base your career and projects? on the support of a company that can just decide to change on what's profitable, what's not. I mean, I'm not trying to get all hippie and peace and love, man. But realistically speaking, if you're not fully open source from the start, then I don't think you can really trust that company to do the right thing all the time. And that's where you should be if you're depending on that software and how that company interacts with you as a, as a client or as a, a dev environment you want them to be reliable because you want to be predictable is that they're going to respond that way like you wouldn't imagine that red hat are going to suddenly sue you for using gcc or something bizarre like that i mean it makes no sense so i don't know i just i don't get people being so quick to change their opinion on microsoft well again i think it's not about changing your opinion quickly i think microsoft have done a lot of work over the last 10 or 15 years to embrace open source and, you know, ha-ha, embrace, extend, extinguish and all that. But they really have done quite a lot to prove that open source is valuable to them. Sure, and, and in the space of a week, they've managed to destroy that. Have they destroyed it or have they just set it back a bit? Well, anybody who trusts them now and thinks they might not do it again is just being foolish, like... Fool me what? Fool me twice? Won't get fooled again. (laughs) I don't know. I mean, I agree with Joe, I have to say. I think the difference in Microsoft now to the Microsoft 20 years ago is phenomenal. You know, it's open source works for the reasons that it makes them a more competitive company. And I have got friends who have worked as developers on Microsoft's code for a long time. And they're not involved in the Linux and open source world. And to them, I know that this is just par for the course, Microsoft changing goalposts and things changing and moving and missing and and always being beholden to the latest APIs as Microsoft sees it. And it's always been that case for them. And that's just the way that it is. And it's normal and it's what they know. Um, So to them, this kind of idealized sense that we have about open source is, is something that they have no comprehension of and I don't think it's going to make much difference to most people so what I'm saying is that there's a kind of a glasnost in Microsoft that we can all kind of feel even if we are a bit cynical of how far they'll go with it but at the same time it is definitely a benefit um, how, however little it is. I think the problem for Microsoft is the fact that free and open source software gives power to the users or you know the other side of the equation. And I honestly can't see a company that started off in such a powerful position with, you know, they got caught out with monopoly practices, etc. There's an awful lot to change in your mindset when you come to that. And I think this is kind of just an example of that, where what is a business decision that would they would get more money for the paying product of Visual Studio. And I, I, you know, I don't think it's the last one we'll see either. Okay, this episode is sponsored by Entroware. Go to entroware.com. Entroware sells computers with Ubuntu and Ubuntu Mate pre-installed. They've got a range of desktops, laptops and servers and most parts are configurable so you can pick the CPU, RAM and storage that's right for you. If you can't find exactly what you want, then do contact them and they'll work with you on a bespoke solution that's perfect for your needs. 
They ship to the UK, Republic of Ireland, France, Germany, Italy, and Spain. And if you do buy one of their machines, there's a little drop down at checkout and you can select late night Linux so they'll know that we sent you. So go to entroware.com for all your Linux computing needs. Let's do a quick KDE corner then before we get out of here. And uh, Graham, you're going to start apparently because you found this KDE Connect for iOS. This is pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, as the resident macOS iOS fanboy, yeah, it's lovely to see KDE Connect on iOS. <laughs> but it does mean that iPhone owners get to enjoy, you know, the nice desktop integration that we've had on Android for quite some time with notifications and being able to type things in from either way. And it's a, it's a lovely app, and we've talked about it before. Um, you know, Will was even talking about it a couple of years ago, getting it integrated into the Ubuntu desktop. Um, and it's it's great to see it on iOS, and really great to see open source software getting in the eyes of Apple devotees, which is the same for the next story too, which is Caden Live, also available on macOS as a test flight preview. Test flights like um, Apple's beta testing platform, you download the app and you get these things pushed to you until they stop letting you. (laughs) But I think this is really significant because on iOS and even on macOS, everybody thinks that these devices are for creatives in italics. Um, but in fact, iMovie on those devices is horribly limited for editing things. You can't hardly do anything other than drag and drop a single video onto a single timeline. And Caden Live is now becoming a really powerful, fully fledged, non-linear video editor that lets you do all kinds of things. And so I think that is also a great advert for open source and KDE Plasma and what can be done with people collaborating and re- releasing their source code for free. Presumably this is going to run natively on the M1 Max as well then. I would have thought so, considering um, they basically just have to build it for you know an architecture they're already building for, yeah. Yeah, so that's really cool, man. Yeah, and you know, Final Cut Pro is the best thing that Apple offers, and I think you know, Kaden Life can finally give it a run for its money on lots, lots of things that we normally do for editing. Maybe not the super advanced YouTuber stuff. Ha. Huh. Well, we'll see about that because uh, Katie and Live was used for the national Italian broadcaster for a TV segment on a comedy show called Honolulu on Italia One. So there you go. And, yeah, that's uh, great. <laughs> well, apparently it was really good and uh, they got through deadlines and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, happy days. Nice. I still don't know how to use the damn thing, but hey. So, Phelan, you put in 23 ways to help KDE, not realizing that it was 25 ways because it's 25 years, isn't it? Well, no, but it isn't, though, because as he says in his last one, and not be hard on people who get numbers and lists wrong, because it's actually 24. And my reason for saying that it's 23 is because item number 20 says, be nice to other FOSS projects like GNOME. And I think that's a load of rubbish. You should be nasty to them. (laughs) Help them up their game. (laughs) All right, well, let me edit this back in our doctor 23, then. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, no, these these are quite a nice set of points fairly obvious stuff but you know it's nice to have a list sometimes where you can look at it and go yeah okay i should really do those things like file bugs and stuff that i don't always do and yeah and then i complain because they don't work properly so you know lots of stuff in there that's good so a nice list fair enough and there's a video kde on touch screens and you've hilariously said not perfect with a k i did indeed yes and it <laughs> is definitely not but it's no. quite a good video anyway and I, another thing, if you see in the links for one of uh, Nico's web pages, he uses the cheaper Pinebook, the 85 euro one, with that's much less power than the Pro. Use it in university to use LaTeX and mats. And you should watch that one if you're into any of that sort of thing, because it looks crazy, but apparently he's doing his university mats bachelor's or whatever it is through that. So pretty cool. And, uh, Plasma 5.23.1 is out. It is. So the 25 uh, anniversary one was out. It came out last week. And unfortunately, I got hit by a nasty bug, which anybody with multi monitors would come across where. So I have my telegram on the right monitor. And if I click on expand the video or a picture, it would actually jump to the far left one. And it looked like it overlaid multiple images or videos on top of each other and flickered like crazy. So I did my due diligence because of that stupid 25 list, damn it. And I actually did log a bug and uh, yeah, it got fixed. So that's quite cool. Um, it's almost like I fixed it myself, really. I mean, you know, <laughs> I think logging the bug is the most important part. I mean, doing the code, whatever. Bit, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, but no, some cool stuff coming up and uh, a big news for NVIDIA users in the 5.23.2, which will be probably out 
in about a week or so. Um, and that's to get proper acceleration and use of GBM backend for Plasma, which I think has been a long time coming because NVIDIA hasn't really supported the uh, renderer that uh, KDE uses quite well. So happy days for NVIDIA people there. And uh, stacks more bugs have been fixed up and uh, Wayland stuff that's coming and lots of good news, as always, every week in that blog post. Did I see something about fingerprint readers as well? Oh, that's right. Yeah, there's a fingerprint reader in there. Uh, so anybody who's got one, it looks like it's going to be way more support for that. Uh, I still think a fingerprint reader on a laptop. I'm not so sure about that, but hey, never trust anybody near you with a cigar cutter. That's all I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, we better get out of here then. We'll be back next week when we'll be talking about haiku as well as some other stuff. So until then, I've been Joe. I've been Phelan. I've been Graham. And I've been Will. See you later. Thank you.